afternoon. How are you? Afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's good. I now welcome representatives of the organisations who made a joint submission on behalf of civil society, including Electronic Frontiers Australia, Digital Rights Watch, Futurewise, Access Now and Blueprint for Free Speech. For the Hansard record, would you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear before the committee? Thank you, Mr Chair. My full name is Angus Murray. I appear today as Chair of Electronic Frontiers Australia's Policy Committee. And it might also be prudent to note that I'm also a Vice President of the Queensland Council of Civil Liberties and a co-author of the Joint Council for Civil Liberties submission. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Sula Dreyfus. I'm the Executive Director of the Australian NGO Blueprint for Free Speech. Uh, we are a free speech organisation. Uh, I also hold an academic appointment at the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne. Thank you. Uh, my name is Justin Clackety. I'm representing FutureWise. Um, we were part of the joint submission headed by Digital Rights Watch Australia and also made a submission of our own. Um, Separately from that, I run a small company that does electronic design and software design. Great, thank you. Although the committee does not require you to give evidence under oath, I should advise you that this hearing is a legal proceeding of the parliament and therefore has the same standing as proceedings of the respective houses. The giving of false or misleading evidence is a serious matter and may be regarded as a contempt of parliament. The evidence given today will be recorded by Hansard and attracts parliamentary privilege. I now invite you to make an opening statement before we begin discussion. Thank you, Mr Chair. Before the committee is a profoundly important <coughs> bill, the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Assistance and Access Bill 2018. This bill has the real potential to alter this country and affect future generations. This includes those who are not yet aware of the serious impact that this bill presents to the fundamental rights that Australians ought to expect, enjoy and be able to enforce. I again thank this committee for the opportunity to address the issues contained within the bill. I will welcome the, com the committee's questions. However, as requested, I firstly wish to make a few brief comments in summary of the submissions relevant to my appearance. As I mentioned, this bill has the potential to profoundly impact the future of Australia and our future generations. And by that, I directly mean Australian children and their children to come. It is incumbent on me and you, in your capacity as members of this committee, members of your electorates, and individuals who call this great country home to ensure that we are considering the future and that the way that actions today may affect that future. In this context, our security is important. However, we must be constantly vigilant to ensure that security does not become a catch cry for the dissolution of basic human rights. Australia does not presently have a federal and enforceable human rights legislative framework. Unlike other Western democratic countries, we are lacking domestic legislation that properly implements international instruments that serve to identify and protect fundamental human rights, including an express right to free speech and privacy. With respect, the extremely short consultation period for these submissions into this bill and the rapid progression of this process is comprehensively wrong. This process has been rushed without reason and progressed without prior, proper and prior consideration. This alone should justify the committee's serious scrutiny. Absent of a consolidated and enforceable human rights legislative framework, this bill should simply not be accepted. Should the bill be passed, it is relevant to note that a joint submission the joint submission by these organisations contained 38 recommendations. And these recommendations, as they were put before the Department of Home Affairs in the initial consultation to the exposure draft, have been endorsed by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy in his submission. In essence, our recommendations, should this bill be progressed, are broadly that consultation, further consultation, should occur to, properly, to allow proper expert and public scrutiny and consideration of this bill, greater judicial oversight is required on all aspects of this bill, the scope of the bill must be reduced, and there must be greater reporting obligations contained within this legislative framework. In addition to our written recommendations, we also recommend that should the bill pass, a two-year sunset period apply and be implemented. I welcome the committee's questions and the, operate, uh, the opportunity to elaborate on our submission. And I believe my colleagues have introductions as well. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thanks. Dr. Dreyfus. Yes. Now, I preface it by saying I'm a bit fluey, so I'm sorry if I cough into the microphone today. If not, I'll cling to my limb sip here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here as one of the authors of this joint civil society submission into the inquiry. Uh, and um, 
uh, the civil society groups around Australia have come together in an effort which has been coordinated by our fellow not-profit um, NGO Digital Rights Watch. Um, and Digital Rights Watch lead author Liz, Lizzie O'Shea was unable to appear here today. Before I speak to the substance, I think it's important to elaborate uh, um, on what Angus said about uh, the processes surrounding this bill, which have thus far been really far from adequate. In fact, it, they've been quite poor. My colleagues have elaborated on, you know, on this dismissive message that it sends from governments to the community to rush things. Um, and uh, I note that the committee will unfortunately not be able to hear from a number of additional experts, contributors to our submission today because of the short notice. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think it's a good recipe. I think that rushing things through in this way is not democracy, it's faux democracy. Um, some years ago, Blueprint for Free Speech used to make regular and detailed submissions to parliamentary committees here in the Australian Parliament, including this one. Um, we stopped doing that. And we stopped doing it because we are a small organization with limited resources. And like many community organizations who we spoke to, we felt that Parliament simply wasn't listening. And <clears throat> whether you're a fan or foe of Donald Trump, that historic change of baton illustrates what happens when the capital stops listening. <clears throat> we hope th that our view will be changed here today. It is the substance of the bill that elicited the huge response from a diverse group of consumer representatives, human rights, and other civil society organizations, industry, and technology, telecommunications companies. I think it's quite interesting to see the broad spectrum of organizations that have made submissions expressing concern about the bill. Often, uh, academics, civil society, and these technology companies will sometimes be at odds on a set of other issues, and yet we find so much common ground in our concern about this bill which should t say something. <clears throat> we urge the government not to rush such far-reaching and complicated legislation and take all the necessary time to engage with the numerous issues raised by these groups, raised by the groups. The Australian public has also responded, which is remarkable given the technical complexity about this bill. Nearly 15,000 people voiced their concern to the exposure draft, speaking out in defense of strong encryption and the right to communicate securely. A public survey by the Alliance for a Safe and Secure uh, Internet shows an overwhelming majority of Australians are deeply alarmed by this bill. A significant majority, greater than 80% of people asked, are concerned about the powers implied in the encryption bill, which could allow the government to force companies to change their products or services to enable the interception and collection of some, someone's personal data without their knowledge and without the authorization of a judge. Nearly three quarters, greater than 74% of people surveyed, are worried that the government's attempts to undertake more cyber surveillance of criminals and terrorists could make the data of all Australians, including healthcare, banking, and other very personal information, less secure. Greater than 84% of Australians polled say it is important or very important that anything the government does to combat crime should not create weaknesses in Australia's online security systems and make it easier for criminals and terrorists to cause further harm to everyday Australians. <clears throat> we collectively maintain that this bill in its current form would legislate powers that are excessively broad, poorly defined, and lack sufficient accountability and transparency. Protecting the public from harm is a priority for all of us here and everyone who contributed to this submission. <clears throat> but the reality is that the bill has the potential to make Australia less safe, despite its stated objectives to the contrary. There is forever a struggle between offensive and defensive when you consider the security of a country. But this bill substantially shifts power to the offensive camp at the expense of the defensive camp. In doing so, it also changes the balance of power in the relationship between the state and the citizen. It is a fundamental change in which the state takes away a piece of personal control over or responsibility for an individual's technological life. <clears throat> I train people in cybersecurity. I train journalists, computer science students, members of the public. I'm one of a tiny piece of the movement happening across Australia to raise cybersecurity posture of our whole society. We need dedicated engineers and educators to do this, not laws that weaken the defensive tools our society needs. 
Australian institutions, universities, companies, as you may well know, government departments, get hammered by foreign cybersecurity attacks. These are well documented in the media. Building or perpetuating any holes in the defense is a bad strategy for dealing with this. Instead of trying to ram this legislation through the committee process and the parliament, the government needs to sit down with the stakeholders over time, engage in the details and collectively come up with a workable, reasonable proposal that meets the objectives of helping enforcement agencies be more effective in the digital age. Law enforcement has a plethora of tools to use, including human gathering. Instead, this bill effectively opens the door, potentially for mass surveillance, by the state, depending on execution. <clears throat> it has until now been economically relatively costly to surveil a target. This forms one of the checks and balances. It has created the right incentive, only pursue a target when there is a good reason. This bill may change the economics of that. We know that from history uh, is that when a capability is enabled, governments will use it whether they should or not. The highest level question here is, why are we here? What is the purpose? The higher purpose, it seems, is to give Australians a safe and free and liberal Western democracy. That's why the security organizations exist. The security state should not become an end in itself. If you take away our civil liberties one by one, to always expand the powers of the security state, you end up without the freedoms you were so easy to protect, so eager to protect in the first instance. You defeat the whole purpose. I can't imagine how hard it is to be a politician worried about keeping your citizenry safe day and night. But you have to have balance. We want security, but not at any price. North Korea is a very safe place. It's just not a place that most Australians would want to live because the freedoms we take for granted have been taken away in the name of security. In summary, this bill overreaches, allowing too much of the state into people's private lives. The thresholds are too low and too vague. They can be abused. The safeguards are poor by design. The bill should contain some positive elements, I would argue as well, marking what space citizens can claim as their own free from surveillance. There are poor accountability issues about the regimes in this bill, particularly uh, born from lack of reporting and transparency from that. So it's illustrative that there's no comprehensive regular reporting and transparency regime to the public in the bill. We want to know, and you, our elected officials, should be told each year, how many requests are made, how many are approved, how many expired, how many are renewed, how many are rejected, how many people were targeted, what's the average length of time of surveillance. These are all very important public figures that should be reported regularly and on time so that we can understand if there is a surveillance regime in place, how it is working and how it is impacting. <clears throat> We note that uh, under previous Attorney General, reporting of telecommunications intercepts reports have been late. Like the reporting requirements, the bill uses vague parameters. So um, term systemic weakness or vulnerability is wafty. Um, there is a cost associated with this proposed bill. And that will be, it will be the companies who bear this initially, but then ultimately it will end up being passed on consumers as these costs are. And one wonders whether we should be paying government to compromise our privacy rights and our security. This bill therefore intrudes upon consumer rights. And consumers have a right to a secure product which is transparent in its security and which doesn't hide known secret flaws in some fashion. I have one final point that I, as far as I know, has not been made in the public debate thus far. It's a broader point. <clears throat> If Australia goes down this point path, it facilitates other less, uh, less rule of law countries potentially to follow it. These countries have fewer human rights safeguards than Australia. Mandating law enforcement agencies have the, having the ability to access or compromise secure communications is a slippery slope. One degree of compromise inevitably leads to another greater degree. But it's a slippery slope because 
any given country's adoption of such a mandate uses the country's analogous adoption as a justification for their own. In other words, they argue, Australia is doing it, so it must be a good or acceptable thing to do. And other countries may therefore follow suit. Some of the, these countries don't have Australia's rule of law culture, which provides at least minimal protections. So when Australia does it, a number of its South Pacific or Asian neighbours may do it as well. And in these countries, without the same protections, these lack of safeguards may cause uh, rampant abuse. If you truly want to be a leader in Asia's Pacific region, you need to understand this. You need to act as though your new domestic law creates signals and models for your developing neighbours. Although Australia primarily adopts laws to protect and advance its own interests, and the bill is portrayed this way, Australia also has an interest in seeing democracy and freedom in other countries, particularly in its Asia-Pacific neighbours. Doing so provides a different sort of security for Australia. This neighbourhood security is one that is equally important. By adopting this bill, Australia will, on the contrary, contribute to unfree countries' lack of freedom by helping them to justify their own surveillance, repression of freedoms, persecution of anyone they feel threatens them, and that might be journalists or human rights activists or such. There are many unintended consequences of this rush bill, all of which are a good reason to walk back from passing it at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dreyfus. Mr. Clarkety. Hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I echo the concerns of Sulet and Angus on much of what they've said. I'd also like to take the opportunity to express my disappointment with the way in which this bill has been drafted in the accompanying consultation process. The bill itself was drafted with no consultation with civil society and on reading likely no cons consultation with experts in the field, whether academic or professional. The department requested feedback on the draft bill, giving little time for adequate investigation, analysis and written communication of the details and ramifications of such far-reaching legislation. Despite this, almost 15,000 individuals and organisations made submissions to the department. The overwhelming majority of those submissions voiced grave concerns with the bill and recommended that it be scrapped. Less than two weeks afterwards, a largely unchanged bill was rushed through the lower house and put to this committee for further review and further submissions. The timeframes for this review are also quite rushed. This process makes a mockery of the consult consultation process and shows a complete disregard bordering on contempt for the constituency of this parliament. While we are privacy advocates, we'd like it noted that we are not privacy absolutists. We respect the work of law enforcement agencies and understand that at times they need particular tools to do their work. In fact, I have previously helped develop hardware and software solutions which are used by agencies, software surveillance solutions, which are used by agencies at all levels within Australia and a number of its allies. However, we believe that these tools should be made available to them only when proven to be both necessary and proportionate and only under a strictly transparent system with judicial oversight. The bill falls short on these requirements. Additionally, this bill, when coupled with the more than 70 national security bills passed since September 11, have drastically changed the relationship between citizens and the state. We are citizens, we are not suspects. As to the bill itself, it presents significant issues with respect to human rights, particularly privacy, in a country where there are no enforceable human rights at the federal level. These powers have very weak oversight or accountability, which is unacceptable in a Western democracy. In addition, it presents, the, it presents what we believe are significant threats to the economy and jobs, specifically in the technology sector, but more broadly in the trust that can be placed in transactions in a digital economy. It is also worthwhile to note that encryption is not just used in the technology sector and banking sector. Industry is heavily reliant on encryption in sectors such as banking, finance, energy, mining and agriculture. The scope of the bill encompasses any company providing a digital service. The scope of a service goes so far as to encompass something as simple as a website. This broad scope includes small businesses and individuals whose already stretched resources could be seconded to carry out the wishes of law enforcement agencies. It also risks investment in Australian technology companies from sources local and abroad, and the ability of Australian companies to sell into markets like the European Union. 
From an information security or cyber security perspective, the bill poses significant risks, so much so that it likely presents a greater risk to national security than the bill purports to resolve. Law enforcement agencies can ask for details and even source code of systems in an effort to uncover unknown vulnerabilities or zero days, which will almost certainly never be reported back to the companies involved. These vulnerabilities are equally and inevitably likely to be used by criminals and state-sponsored hackers to attack these same systems. In addition, the bill allows agencies to order technical capability notices to force companies to create tools or vulnerabilities to allow these agencies to access systems. The explanatory memorandum, memoranda notes that TCNs will not require a company to create systemic backdoors, yet this is exactly what the bill requires. It has no clear definition of a system, and the scope of those affected is unlimited. It clearly does not take into account the way modern systems are designed, tested, and deployed at scale, and will almost certainly affect the entire user base of such systems, not just the intended target. It is clear from the reading of the bill the department has either not consulted with anyone in the information security field, let alone experts, or if they have, they have completely disregarded their input. This bill requires significant rework and time should be taken to assess the economic and security implications of any new drafts put forward. Additionally, stakeholders such as civil society and information security experts should be involved in the process. It is in fact our view that no such legislation be presented until there is enforceable human rights legislation at the federal level, through which this future and previous legislation and actions by the government can be held accountable. I welcome any questions. Well, thank you for those comments. Am I characterising your position fairly if, if I were to understand that you'd rather the bill not go ahead at all? Um, In its present form, certainly. Yeah. That's okay. Correct. So yeah. I w explicitly. Yes. Yes. Okay. What, what I hope to get is a sense of how you would improve this bill now um, to the point where you'd be happy with it. And I've got your recommendations here, but just on the public record, it'd be good uh, hitting the main issues that you have with the bill. Before we do that, Senator McAllister, did you have Can any? I just, say mm. I just need to put on the public record that despite our shared surname, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Dreyfus and I are not related. No. <laughs> Uh, although we have met previously uh, in a professional capacity. Yeah. <laughs> if I might answer your question, sure. Mr Chair. Thank you. Uh, and I take it back to the, the points that I iterated before. There are essentially five aspects, and under each aspect there are a number of sub-aspects, which I'm happy to go into as well. The bill shouldn't go ahead without further, clearer and more transparent expert and public scrutiny. The, the whole process to date has been rushed, and I think that's apparent on everything that's been said by my colleagues in, in a large number of the submissions that are presently before this committee. The second is with respect to greater judicial oversight, and I appreciate that that's a question that I think has been uh, elaborated on today. I'm happy to elaborate on that extensively. Judicial oversight uh, within the judiciary should cover all aspects of the bill. The scope of the bill should be reduced. The, as I understand this bill, the intention that sits behind it is the necessary protection of the Australian public uh, from counter-terrorism, sex offence, etc., <coughs> the most heinous of crimes. The scope of the bill is significantly broader than that. And there must be significant increases in the reporting obligations that sit under this bill. This bill has the potential in a country where there is no federal enforceable human rights legislation to be misused in atrocious manners. I don't say that that's something that is likely under the current situation we sit in. As I made submissions before, the concern that I take on this is the future. And this is the first step, or rather, it is one of steps being taken currently and post 9-11 that may be irretrievable later on down the track. And whether that is in the best interest of Australian future is a question I leave for the committee. And finally, as I said, if the bill was to pass, that there be a two year or a period at least uh, sunset uh, from implementation so it could be addressed if there were issues discovered in the process of comprehensive and candid reporting. As I said, I'm, I'm happy to take any of that. I might also disclose that I have a legal background on this as well. My colleagues put their background. I have a legal background. I'm happy to take questions on any aspect of that. Sure. Well, I appreciate that you, all three of you put a, a philosophical context around your position, which was helpful, um, most of which I'm sympathetic to, by the way, as a Liberal. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the, the, problem, the problem we have is, uh, this has been expressed by the, the commissioner, the police commissioner this morning, over 90% of data being lawfully intercepted by the AFP now uses some form of encryption. So the challenge going forward is uh, how do we disrupt terrorist plots, uh, you know, 
uh, child sex offenders and the like, uh, especially when by 2020 almost 100% of their communications is likely to be encrypted. That's the question before us and that's the challenge. And I'm very interested in, in your view on, on how we go about that in a way that you'd find satisfactory. Mr Chair, if I might take that as well and then I'll allow my colleagues to elaborate on any aspect that I miss on this. What I first quote, uh, and I quote from the UN uh, or Special Rapporteur uh, on the Right to Privacy, in response to exactly this position, and I quote, but these statistics do not comprise either evidence or argument. While encryption may affect 90% of ASIO's priority cases, it needs to be asked whether the nece necessary information or evidence was obtained through other means, and whether the information actually was material to the matter at hand. The Department of Home Affairs and ASIO can already access encrypted data with specialist decryption techniques or start or end points where the data is not encrypted, and I end the quote. While I continue to answer your question, Mr Chair, with respect to that first concept, and the, the genesis of this, I suppose, is necessity. I don't quarry, quarrel with the fact that this is necessary, or some step is necessary to safeguard Australians, but that shouldn't be dealt with in isolation. If security becomes the ultimate prerogative, we dissipate human rights. It, it needs to be dealt with in more than just the necessity. It needs to go to two other points in my respectful submission that this is an adequate solution to achieve a certain means and that it is proportionate to the reasonable expectations of the Australian community. If I expand on each of those concepts, adequacy and proportionality slightly, this has been a rushed process. This is a concept that was introduced, I believe, in 2016 by the former Prime Minister and the former Attorney General as a war on maths. There was no, to my knowledge, consultation uh, process that involved civil society in the drafting of this bill. The exposure draft had a very limited period of review from experts and industry and civil society. This process that leads to this hearing today has also been expedited, with no real reason provided. The adequacy is something that could be opened up by further consultation to the tech industry, to civil society and to interested stakeholders. And to that I say, there are other means to achieving these endpoints. There is ample evidence, uh, and I believe that the UN Special Rapporteur deals with this evidence, where education may actually simply be the key. These tools exist. Law enforcement is simply not educated to understand the means to which they might achieve these same outcomes. And that's the concept of adequacy. Proportionality is a difficult concept to deal with in the current climate. We don't have enforceable human rights legislation. We're not the United States. We don't have a Bill of Rights. We're dealing with this in a situation that is essentially a vacuum. The proportionality that sits on this is, again, I take into the future. I would struggle to say that this is something I would be comfortable saying to children of the future, Sorry, anything and everything you do can, without your knowledge, be subject to government scrutiny. I think that that is a dangerous path to follow without there being a check and balance that sits over the top of that, and that is exactly the purpose of our judiciary. And to that point, if I can cap off slightly further and elaborate, the decision recently handed down by the European Human Rights Court, uh, Big Brother Watch and the United Kingdom, I take a quote from that and I read, Review and supervision of secret surveillance measures might come into play at three stages. When the surveillance was first ordered, while it was being carried out, or after it had been terminated. As regards the first two stages, the very nature and logic of secret surveillance dictated that not only the surveillance itself, but the accompanying review should be effected without the individual's knowledge. Consequently, since the individual would not necessarily be prevented from, would necessarily be prevented from seeking effective remedy of his or her own accord, or from taking direct part in any review proceedings, it was essential that the procedures established should themselves provide adequate and equivalent guarantees safeguarding his or her rights. In a field where abuse was potentially so easy in individual cases and could have such harmful consequences for democratic society as a whole, it was in principle desirable to entrust supervisory control to a judge, judicial control offering the best guarantees of independence, impartiality and proper procedure. I end that quote and emphasise that quote for the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Murray. Mr Dreyfus and McCallis, Senator McCallis. Yeah. Uh, look, I'll try and keep it very brief because we're running up against the clock. Um, thanks very much for your submission and I note your remarks about having limited resources and it is actually very important that civil society does participate and we're grateful for all of your organisations for making a submission. Um, Dr Dreyfus, you spoke about um, law enforcement in the digital age, and that is indeed a, a nice way of encapsulating the dilemmas that the Chair referred to. Um, and I want to test an idea that you put to us, which is that this changes the fundamental balance of power between the state and citizens. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, that's 
probably the opposite proposition that was put to the committee in the written submission from the Department of Home Affairs, which argued, that, <laughs> yes, but we, we, we should no, test good. this, glad, we should test we these it. things. So what the department would tell us in their written submission is that in fact in recent times um, that balance has changed in favour of those who would um, avoid surveillance um, through the use of encryption. And their argument, I think, would be that through these, through this bill, they seek simply to restore the balance that previously existed. I wondered if you'd like to respond to that. Yes. <clears throat> so there are a couple of things. Um, there's referred in the academic literature to the philosophical side of this debate is the right to whisper. So do you have the right, if you go to the parish pump, to you know, pump water and whisper to one of your neighbors without someone listening to you. And I think you could say, well, in older times, um, you didn't have police surveillance capability to actually do that. The problem is we live our lives increasingly in a digital world. Right? So our whole existence, in fact, is on that world. Therefore, data collection is much easier for the state than it would have been previously. As we've moved into that space, it's not just about data collection, it's now also about analysis, so big data, um, data analytics, and increasingly AI analysis of that. You can see these things coming together in a Venn diagram, and if the state is in the middle of that, combined with their powers, the potential for abuse is very severe indeed. So <clears throat> I would argue, if you don't want to end up in a world of Tom Cruise minority report, uh, if you don't want to have a world of predictive policing in a way that puts people in jail for thought crimes, and I don't say that's what happens now, but you could see a, a future that looks like that, you have to have adequate both transparency and also oversight, and that includes judicial oversight. In terms of actually that uh, swinging balance, I say that this is not a, there is no capability for law enforcement to investigate a target. There is, and as my colleague has highlighted, there are capabilities out there that allow you to do it. I suspect it is a gap in knowledge and a gap in resources. Now, I'm not arguing for more law enforcement, but I am saying that it does, it is a restrictive thing in the nature of how many targets you can actually surveil, how many old-fashioned video cameras can you place in someone's house with a due warrant over their keyboard to know what their passwords are that they're typing in, or whatever it may be, okay? <clears throat> and that that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing because it is, in a sense, a layer of protection against mass surveillance. And that's really the key concern we've got. It's not, it's mass surveillance, but it's also about mass security impinging by doing things like um, uh, knowing that there is a fatal flaw in Microsoft Word and not releasing that to the company and therefore to the public to actually fix it. And then exposing 23 million other people's copies of their hardware, uh, their, of their software, because you know they don't have the upgraded version. So I understand where law enforcement is coming from. I don't agree that traditionally they had all listening, all seeing capabilities. That wasn't the case. But I could see that they would be very tempted by this environment where they could get the data. I'm struck by a senior former NSA official, an engineer, who went to the former head of the legal department at the NSA, concerned about the uh, pervasive mm -hmm. technologies that were being used to, we now see, do large-scale um, population information monitoring. Okay? Surveillance, population surveillance. And he said, you don't understand. This is what the council said. You don't understand. We just want the data, all the data. And it was a really a shock moment. And I don't f think for a moment that his intentions or the intentions of those of the NSA that were driving that were evil in any way. But it's like there's a loss of understanding of the rest of society saying, well, wait a minute, this is my life. And while there may be five terrorists, there are 23 million other Australians who are not and who uh, should be afforded some independence and privacy. I guess what the committee and the parliament needs to decide is where in this shifting landscape are our individual rights to reside? That's really the important question. Thank you, Jim. Uh, can I first of all say uh, that the committee is indebted to all of you for the uh, very quick 
uh, what manner in which you've been able to put together uh, very detailed submissions. Uh, we're also indebted to you for your oral evidence given to the committee here today. Uh, we're up against a time constraint. Uh, the committee has already announced on our website that this was to be and has been the first hearing uh, in this inquiry and that there will be further hearings of the committee uh, on dates yet to be fixed, uh, likely to be in uh, late October or November. Um, can I leave? I, I don't, because of the time constraint, wish to advance any questions to you today, but I would leave open the possibility that at a future hearing we may uh, invite all of you to return on behalf of the groups that you represent. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to check that, um, subject of course to date and availability, uh, you're all prepared to return. Yeah. Yes. Very happy. Entirely. And might I also put on the record, this is exactly the issue, is the rushed process of this. So might I just emphasise, uh, Mr Dreyfus, that this is the issue that we're saying this is being rushed and I wholeheartedly embrace significantly greater public consultation than the comments you've just made. So, Heard and understood. Good. Thank you all very much for listening to us today. It makes a big difference. No, thank you for taking the time to come and speak with us. Do you have any questions on notice? I don't think. No. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you'd be prepared to come back to us and perhaps we go into more of the detail of the bill itself. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you once again for appearing today. Thank you. It would be appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.